You know what blows my mind about this all? If the listeners haven't figured this out. In 2019, the United States did not have any idea how all of the services would collectively fight China. All players, low down. Hi, Striker. It's been a minute. It has been, Paco. Good morning to you. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, or afternoon, or wherever you guys are listening out there. Uh, Striker and I go back about 10 years. He's a uh, longtime listener and reader, first time caller. We can talk about a ton of things today, but I brought him on the show specifically to talk about how the U.S. military predicts and plans for the future, uh, or it, it at least tries to. I think in this episode, our listeners are going to hear some eye-opening things that they probably weren't expecting. I'm Mike Paco Benitez, and this is The Merge, where we make sense of defense in an enjoyable way. And some otherhood before uh, we get started. If you like what you hear, leave us a rating, a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your, uh, your pod. It really helps. Same thing goes at YouTube. Uh, you know what else helps if you tell other people about us? So spread the word. And then finally, follow us on the socials on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Or those, those are the big three that we're on. And if you are picking up what we're putting down, consider supporting us on Patreon. Uh, it has different tiers of support. It's a pay what you want model. So no matter what, you get it for free. Uh, but a little goes a long ways to a kind of crowdsource uh, our support. And the, the lowest tier is called the Piddle Pack. It's $3 a month because uh, we make every drop count. <laughs> uh, all right. So admins complete striker. Uh, why don't you tell everyone about yourself? Thanks Paco. So, uh, Colonel Don striker Haley, I've been in the air force for 24 years, getting ready to retire here soon. I started out ROTC at Vanderbilt and then uh, went to pilot training at NJEPT, your native joint jet pilot training. I joined the strike Eagle community was there for most of my career as an F 15 E pilot. Paco knows we spent the time in the 492nd together, um, so I was a DO there, commander in the 333rd, four deployments total. And uh, since uh, that time, I've my career, the latter part of my career has been spent uh, as an Air Force strategist. So I went to the School of Advanced Military Studies on a fellowship, and uh, that put me in a kind of a separate branch of being a strategic planner. So I went to the Pentagon after that, and I spent three years there worked in skunk works so futures and concepts and air force futures also uh, was an air force liaison at darpa and the advanced capabilities office during that same time frame and then uh through 2020 until i left the building i was this joint war gaming chief for the air force so did the service level we, which we'll get into i know in this episode we'll talk about war gaming um and then also did the a lot of the joint war gaming pieces of that since then, I've been working with AFWorks, the Agility Prime program, and uh, getting ready to uh, wrap it up here next month. Awesome. And just to uh, be clear for the uh, the listeners out there, when he says Skunk Works, that's not the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. That's the a office in the Pentagon and the air staff, that's called. We have the skunks, the owls. They're, they all have different names. I can't remember them all right now. All some kind of barnyard animals. Yes. Yeah, they're all barnyard animals. It's uh, some naming convention holdover hold over from uh, way back when. So interesting fun fact about Stryker. He's the only person I know who somehow magically did uh, did some of these typical paint by numbers career stuff backwards. So he went to uh, after he left the cockpit, went to a staff assignment, did a full staff assignment, and then went to. Air Command and Staff College, where, of course, he graduated number one in his class because he did three years of staff before he went to school to learn about the staff. Is that right? Did I get that right? Yeah, that's right. I kind of skipped over that part, but went to uh, <laughs> I went to Korea for two years where I worked in CJ5 plans as an operational planner, so writing the war plans for Korea. I was the major that was doing making all the PowerPoint slides and typing all the words out and then went to air command and staff college. And then that kind of got me interested in planning. So after my command and DO tour, I went back into that and that's what I spent the last five years doing. And the reason I bring that up is that if you haven't figured it out yet by, by listening to the strikers bio, he he's basically spent his entire career looking at near mid and long-term planning, future threat forecasting trends, to figure out what we need to do when and, and why it, and where the impacts are going to be. So we can spend a trillion dollars on something, but if it's not going to make a dent 
on really what we want uh, to shape the uh, the environment for the United States, and it's not going to matter. And so that's what he spent a large part of his career on. That's where his passion is. So that's why we have Stryker on today. And to to frame it before we get started, how hard and messy future forecasting it is. Like we can't, we have supercomputers and we still can't accurately predict the weather outside 10 days. That's why in all your apps, it only goes out to about 10 days. And after that, it's like, meh, I don't know. It's too hard because uh, you can anticipate, you know, trends, seasons and patterns, but you really can't predict like to like what degree, what's the percentage of rain 10 days from now. And, and really that's where the, the trend forecasting and mega trends and, and things like that, that's what feed into to shape and bound how do we predict the future. Now, we're not going to talk in this episode about trend forecasting and megatrends. There's some really cool stuff about that that goes out into the 2030s, 2040s. Uh, the Air Force does that. Well, Striker, you'll probably talk a little bit about that uh, in their mm-hmm. futures uh, planning. But uh, we're going to devote actually a whole other episode to talk about that. So um, what I will do is I will condense everything in that future episode down to why everything points to China. And then from there, we'll talk about what's been going on with, with Stryker and uh, concept planning. So if we start at 2049, that's the year that sticks out to me. That is a few things. Uh, that is the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. That has been designated as a goal line for China to, to complete the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. So there will be a premier global power. That is the plan. They've said it. They've thrown that out there. They're doing it. They started it 20 years ago. If you back that up, 2035, that's their timeline when they would have completely modernized their entire armed forces. Again, this started 20 years ago. They've uh, they've already traded half their army to build a modern air force, a bigger navy, and a bigger missile force so they can project power. And if we back that up, we get to a guy named uh, Admiral Davidson. He was the Indo-PACOM commander. And Stryker, these years are probably very, very familiar to you as we talk about this. So I'm, I'm just teeing it up for you. So Admiral Davison back in 2021, uh, he referenced basically a six to 10 year window where he thought that uh, we would no longer be able to d- deter China because they were rising power uh, for the invasion of Taiwan. And so if you do the math, what was called the Davidson window is 2027 to 2031, if my math is right. And those numbers are kind of confirmed by the CIA. Bottom line is, 2027 to 2030, 2035 and 2049 are kind of the big three uh, milestones that are often referenced when you look at China. Uh, And why China is they already have the world's largest Navy, the world's largest army, the world's largest missile force. Uh, They're the world's largest exporter. They're the second largest economy uh, and quickly rising. And they have those global ambitions. And so that sets the stage of all the stuff that's been going on in the Department of Defense probably the last seven or eight years. Uh, but I think that's really going to set the stage for kind of everything that Stryker has been focused on, which really go back, guess what, about seven, eight years. All right. Mm-hmm. So we framed the conversation and we're going to jump into concepts, wargaming and uh, capabilities, requirements, con ops, doctrine, how it all fits together. Those are all buzzwords. Stryker, where do we start? Is there a trillion dollar crystal ball somewhere in the Pentagon's basement? No, no, but there is a purple water fountain. And there is a purple water fountain. Yes, and I have seen so it many, many said times. said that if you drink from the purple water fountain, then you will gain enough wisdom to uh, to make all these prognostications work that we'd be able to read into the future. But it's <laughs> that, unfortunately, the purple water fountain is now behind a piece of glass and doesn't have running water to it. Yeah, you so, probably wouldn't want to drink it anyways. That's, that's pretty old. So. It's been there for a long, long time. Yeah. It definitely looks old. Uh, all right, so, so we don't have a trillion dollar crystal ball. Um, are we wiretapping brains of aliens in Area 51 so we can see into the future? Nope. Uh, nope. Optimus Prime might be there, but other than that, there's not much else in Area 51. So it's a good process that, you know, I think that has started, you know, or rekindled. I would say when you put this time frame, um, I'm thinking it's 2018, uh, the National Defense Strategy in 2018 is really what kind of re-kicked the department back into this f- a focus in futures planning. Um, not that we'd stop doing it, but, you know, there was still a lot of futures talk. But as you know, uh, up through uh, 2018, I think the, the focus was on, you know, fighting low intensity wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and, and other places around the world. And so we weren't organizing, training and equipping our forces with a 
real future in mind, but the, the NDS in 2018 is where some of these processes got dusted off and have been reinvigorated since that time frame. I would say. Yeah, that's a good point. I was doing some research and there was about a, there was definitely an acknowledged holiday. <laughs> we'll call it strategic thinking holiday that, that the Pentagon did for over a decade where there was future games and trends analysis, but it was mostly as a sidecar science project not mm -hmm. really taken seriously. Uh, you didn't develop doctrine against it. You didn't use that to drive requirements and spend money on capabilities to, to do things. It was mostly just like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, let's go back to work. And so uh, you're right, the, the 2018 uh, National Defense Strategy, uh, we were both in the Pentagon, I think, at the time when that came out. Um, yep. And that started driving a few things. And there's a whole bunch of things behind the scenes that happened before, during, and after that came out from the beginning. The first thing was it became clear um, when they started getting people together to talk about this whole great power competition uh, that they had uh, the Pentagon had too many service stovepipes and we were thinking very regional uh, across some invisible policy lines on a map that someone drew in 1986. And then all of that created some misaligned interest because the way that you're, you're organized. So there's a saying that you stand where you sit. And so everyone had their own lenses they were looking at this but there wasn't really anyone that was really looking at like the big picture the air force for example you could go out and you could buy uh 1736 uh f-35s but if it wasn't organized or trained at the operational level not the tactical level then it really could just be irrelevant it doesn't matter and so having a way to like how do we stitch all of these things together that was really where the blind spot was and good on um socom if I remember right, in 2019, SOCOM is the one who kind of pulled everyone together because they're the only combatant command, they're the only kind of four-star organization that had a global perspective. And so state, they started driving a thing. I think it's called the Joint Force Operating Scenario is what it was called, what became Joint War Fighting Concept. Am I saying that right? I'm not sure if that started with SOCOM necessarily. It really uh, it, it branched out. So you had old the old JIFICOM that was then pulled apart and then put under the joint staff. And so really the, the J7 uh, started to really walk, wake up to this concept of the joint warfighting concept and a globally integrated war game where we would work and think about how we would do future warfighting and then test some of those ideas in a joint format across the services. And that, that effort really started about 2019, to your point, is where uh, joint Warfighting Concept 1.0. I was there as the Air Force representative on the ground, went to Suffolk uh, multiple times. And then we have now since iterated on that Joint Warfighting Concept all the way through uh, last summer, uh, the version three of that. And along with that, a lot of the processes and how the Warfighting Concept, and really uh, we can walk through the whole process because it, it'll take a minute to get it all out, but the Really what comes out of that joint order finding concept is concept required capabilities, which is a kind of a future way of thinking about requirements. Really what we're trying to do is think about what are my requirements in 10 years, as opposed to the way that we have migrated towards doing requirements up to that point, which was the combatant commands look at what are my capability gaps right now and then I start with those capability gaps and then I come up with a requirement and then I go through feeling that requirement and you've talked about on the show what that looks like. So I now I now get a capability fielded 10 years later. So this concept driven threat informed way of doing capability development is a way of trying to lean into the future and trying to anticipate what those requirements are a little bit ahead of time so we can start that development earlier that's really kind of the big picture what what changed that's what we're trying to do in the building and to your point it's really hard to know what that looks like so we're getting like a weatherman who gets paid to be wrong uh you're paying a lot of people to be wrong but we just want to be mostly right and not all wrong how's that you know what blows my mind about this all if the listeners haven't figured this out in 2019, the United States did not have any idea how all of the services would collectively fight China. Like that is mind blowing. And that's been publicly acknowledged now. The Lieutenant General uh, Wesley, who was uh, Army F uh, Features Command, 
he kind of came out and, and acknowledged that several years after the fact. But uh, we, when the NDS came out, that was kind of the come to Jesus of like, oh, we really need to uh, to get our shit together. So you were on JWC 1.0. We're going to talk about this for just a second because this is this really matters. So again, this was not acknowledged at the time, but the original JWC 1.0 failed during the wargaming process, uh, as I understand it. And I think it's a detail. Again, it wasn't released at the time, not until JWC 2.0 came out. I don't think many listeners are aware of uh, Stryker. You were there. What happened? So a great question. I'll start with this. So, you know, the whole idea of this concept development is I come up with some ideas on how I'm going to fight and it starts really kind of at the operational level. So it's the operational level game, how, how the big piece is moving. And then if I'm going to get into capabilities, at some point I have to get uh, from what we call a con op, which is operational level ways of thinking about how I do maybe air superiority or uh, maritime superiority. And then getting down more to the tactical level, which is when we write con imps, that's getting real specific. Like how do I do man to man teaming 10 years from now? And, and, what I try to do there is get really specific, um, specific enough that I can really start thinking about what those requirements may look like. So, and what you do is you take these ideas of this operational and kind of high tactical level future warfare, and I test them in this wargaming environment. Now, the one thing I will say about war games, because one of the things we want to talk about, what are war games useful for? The first question that any senior leader asks when the war game is over is what? Did, Did we, we win? win? That's, the first <laughs> that's right. It's like, that's the first it's question. A... <laughs> and it, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's always the first question. It's the question that everyone wants to know. And the problem is, it's the wrong question. Yeah. Because war games are not useful for determining outcomes, that they're not meant to be predictors. Uh, a war game is meant to be a plausible scenario where I can test some ideas. So sometimes I think we get a little too wrapped up in this, like, who won, who lost. Uh, so, before we even go down that, I have to say that's probably the wrong question to ask. Yeah, we'll get into uh, we'll get into war gaming uh, right after we finish uh, JWC. That, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. So we pressure test uh, JWC. Turns out like there's probably some things we could do better. Uh, yep. So to your point, not necessarily a failure, but it, it made an iteration. Uh, it's the concept sure. uh, we pressure tested it didn't quite work out, and so JWC 2.0 came out. And that came out in 2021. And mm -hmm. this is where the first concept of, quote, integrated deterrence uh, comes from, which ended up being in the 2022 NDS. So I understand, and Stryker, you, you may have moved on by then, but uh, I understand this came out the four functional battles, which is the things that turn into buzzwords. So joint fires, so all the main, all the main fires, this is where the army kind of pivoted into logistics under attack or contested logistics, which is... Not only they're going to attack the bases, but attack the supply chains. So I think World War mm -hmm. II. And then now um, thinking of like even attacking like tier two, tier three suppliers. So like think cyber attacks and redirecting uh, shipping invoices and things like that. Um, then you have information advantage. So sense and make sense of more at a faster rate than the adversary can. And then finally putting it all together is command and control on a global scale across the combatant mm -hmm. commands which it became JADC2. Is that, uh, is that check? Yeah, it is. And so those four functional battles, it's a, we've looked at it from like an organizing construct. Like, you know, would it be useful to task organize around functional battles? But um, I think what we've found in some of that is it's not useful as an organi organizational construct, but it's a useful way of thinking about war fighting. And so when you start bending it in some of that ways, it, it, it helps bring, for instance, focus on to logistics and just how it's the it's the pacific we've learned this in world war ii it's not new but in some of our previous iterations of war gaming to be honest we didn't really have the capability to really look into i mean we have like one or two logisticians and really if you're going to look at operational level logistics on a global scale you can make that its own war game I and mean, it takes such incredible expertise so I do think that it started putting, shifting some of the focuses uh, operationally in the right areas and thinking about fires and we start thinking longer range fires and then how do I deconflict those fires? Because it really becomes a command and control and authorities problem. And so where we struggle uh, in our organizational constructs is decision making. And so what you see is slow decision making and we're not able to iterate as quickly as the Chinese who have a, a different organizational construct and who at the strategic level can perhaps move faster. 
So I think when you start seeing trends of focusing on how we command and control, trends of focusing on logistics, those are places where we fail uh, in the war games. And so we, we learn, we iterate. That's where the those functional battles really come from, is from the learning from the when we failed in 1.0. But what went wrong? Uh, that's where those things went wrong. And it, those are hard problems to fix. Fixing command structures, decision making, and it really gets down to not just operational level, but strategic level decision making and how we do that and how do we do that faster. And so a lot of that comes into understanding the problem well and then having some of those authorities bundled and thought about ahead of time. And so those are things we experimented on. And, and I think you can see that the slow trend and conceptually of where we need to go. And then now the hard work is carrying that concept out into the reality. Understanding those problems, which become wicked problems as you describe them, uh, because the scale and just orders of magnitude of, of things that the complexity you have to navigate, uh, there, there, are, there are tactical manifestations that just aren't even understood. So for instance, mm -hmm. if you understood how munitions and fuel and all that actually moves around in theater, you would, you know, you go to a red flag. All right, everyone today, all the fighters on the blue side, you're not allowed to use afterburner. Would that change your tactics? Like, oh yeah, absolutely. Well, guess what? There's no fuel in the AOR. So you have to make every drop a fuel count. You're not going to use afterburner. Like the fact that you're, you know, 0.9 Mach versus 1.1 Mach, like probably not going to make a difference in the war. Uh, but it will make a difference if you can't, if you don't, can't get the airplanes in there. Or uh, the other one I like was, uh, you know, everyone's got a full missile load out. Like, well, turns out that's probably not going to happen based on the time and place of the choosing of whatever this war starts. And then uh, my, my, my last one I liked was the having flown the EX before I, before I retired. You know, the EX can carry a lot of missiles, right? So normally, say you had a whole squadron of F-15 EXs and you had like two spares. Well, those two spares that are fully loaded, that's 24 missiles that are sitting on the ground. You're probably going to hedge your bets and maybe your spares aren't going to be fully loaded. Maybe they're going to be half loaded and you're going to need those missiles you again, you're hedging bets to get the most missiles and the most rails with the most fuel airborne at the time and place of our choosing. And those tactical manifestations of those strategic problems is something where there's kind of a disconnect still, uh, I think, in the force right now. Uh, but that's for the people in uniform to worry about. We're not really going to talk about that today. But I just want to acknowledge like that's how it trickles down to, uh, to people. Uh, if you're still wearing a flight suit today listening to this, that's why it matters. I think a lot of that, you know, the iteration and the learning comes from immersing yourself in the problem that's I think it's the utility of the war game is uh, it, it, it's a construct that allows you to put yourself in this kind of seminar feature scenario think about this problem what i witnessed over three iterations of a globally integrated war game and development of the war fighting concept is a better understanding of the threat like you got to start with understanding the problem and where when we started in 2019 there was not a common understanding of what the actual what the problems were um, and that I, it's, it's actually was great. I went back, I was the chief of staff with the general high note for the last iteration, of the globally integrated war game last summer. And I, it's a completely different playing field now. And in, in terms of seeing where the staff is and the general understanding from the senior leaders all the way down, uh, it's improved quite a bit. There's we've learned. So that part is good. So JWC is a joint war fighting concept 3.0 is the new and improved one. It was just recently approved. You know, the public probably won't see it, but it's approved and it's, it's in there by in there. It's in the Pentagon somewhere. What I do know, what I've heard about it through, uh, through the press so far, just in this past uh, week from this recording, actually, is that it's actually more aligned to the 2022 national defense strategy. So it's actually implementing a strategy. That's the first thing I was like, okay, that's good. The second thing, which I thought was really compelling was it actually shifted the time frame of you know what is this war fighting future war fighting concept and it's a very near time frame 2027 to 2030 is what i've seen in the press which is uh it matters because that's going to drive funding pentagon budget everything if that's the nearest time focused strategic concept that i've seen in my career that's only a few years off of the horizon right now the Global Integrated War Game last year was testing uh, JWC 3.0 and iterating on some of the ideas that got published there. And there's a lot of goodness there. So what we struggle in the wargaming world is if um, if I'm wanting to test a concept and I use a time frame that's five years out, 
So the way that I do this, if I if I make a scenario that's uh, 2028, 20, five years from now, I'm going to build my force. So I'm going to look at my program forces. I'm going to look at the you know program technologies and everything. I'm going to put all those pieces on a map. You know that takes six months to go through all that with all the services to set in the set in the the uh, chessboard before you go and play. And the problem is that if the war game is supposed to help me test new ideas, well, in five years there's not that much difference in my force doesn't really allow me to change the the chessboard that much. So it's actually more useful in my mind when you're thinking force design in the future to pick a future date a little bit further in the future. Let's go 15 years because now I've got a few different budget cycles and where I can actually make some changes to my force design and then put those pieces on the board. Because if I just do five years, I, it's, I'm already, I have it. It's already done. That's right. You're going you're gonna to go to war with what you have. <laughs> right. So you kind of, it's helpful to do the, your analyses a little further in the future because that allows me to actually do something different with the chessboard and, and come up with some different concepts. Otherwise, I'm just, I'm just doing a war game that's essentially like a, something the combat command should do. It's a current day war game, more or less. That was exactly my takeaway when I read that. I was like, is that a is that a typo? I'm like, no, I saw it in two different sources and it said maybe whoever said it that was quoted said it wrong. But that was my impression too. I'm like, that's like five years away. Like you're already like at the end of a, basically right at the edge or outside of the fight up, the planning cycle, the five-year planning mm -hmm. cycle for the budget for the Pentagon. Like you're not going to feel the new aircraft or a new like infantry fighting vehicle or some kind of like all domain network that's global in, in five years. That's just not how the U.S. industrial base or the congressional process works right now. Yeah, you know, for the war game, I, I read the the concept, and there's a lot of good stuff in there. My critique would be is that the document, uh, at least as the last time I read it, was around 70 or 80 pages, and it's TSSCI, the entire document, which means that it's just really hard to read, you know. And so, if my intent is to take this document and it, for it to drive joint force design, because of the security level, there's a lot of people that don't even have, you know accounts where they can access TSSCI information or, or have a, a place, a SCIF, where you can go and read the document, even if it's printed out. So it makes it a very inaccessible <laughs> Although, uh, although if you've been watching the news lately, you'd think any senior airman, uh, any E3 in the military has a has a access to a top secret email account and can just print off anything and put it in their pocket. Uh, which, which you don't. <laughs> you know, even at the war game, when we were in the middle of the war game, I think there were three people who could you know, had printing privileges in the war game who could actually get to putting that out. So it just makes it just, so you're even as a war game participant, it's difficult to get the couple hundred people who are participating in the war game who are testing out the concept to read the concept because it's really long. So that just means that there's only a few people who actually understand what it says. And there's just a lot of nuance. So it's just one of those, you just have to be really careful about messaging and and who who's actually read it and who actually understands it um uh so that's there's a lot of great information but you know how we use it, it there's probably only a few subject matter experts who actually can explain all the nuance and and kind of give you the so what out of it we're going to jump into war games in a second but since you mentioned um where you worked with high note um let's talk about the organization real quick so the army the Army Futures Command was set up in 2018 by uh, by General Milley when he was the Army Chief of Staff, and he set that up uh, to be co-equal uh, in command to the Army Forces Command, the Army Material Command, and the Army Training and Doctrine Command. The Air Force at the same time was actually trying to do the same thing. So there was there was a proposed Air Force Futures Major Command construct um, that uh, that didn't manifest itself good friend of mine was uh, was working that as a uh, as a three star and then a four star at the time that didn't really work out but it kind of evolved into an air force futures office it started as an office right uh, and that's where i think you got your assignment right when it was getting stood up i remember going to the first kickoff meeting i think of that it was the al four alternative yeah. futures meeting yeah afwick so it was the air force warfighting yeah. integration capability uh, was kind of the the test construct, and then it eventually reorganized and became Air Force Futures. Yep, and now it's a separate directorate, right? It's the A 
five seven. Is that right? Or a seven? The a five seven. Correct. Okay. So which and when we added the, you know, we kind of went through this uh, when I first got there. It was the a five eight. Uh, for those who are not in staff parlance, it's the Air Force's attempt to try to bring strategy and programming uh, under one construct, which in 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 concept is a good idea because you would want your strategy and your programmers to be linked at the hip. But when you put that under one three star on the staff, that three star is it's just too much work to be honest to cover down all the the, the pieces of that. So I think we went back to the, we separated the five and the eight. We had the the great divorce, um, but it didn't mean it didn't functionally change the the fact that you still have to have relationships between your strategists and your programmers. Um, but then we added the seven uh, in that construct because the seven is really your concepts pieces, you know, and it really is kind of bringing back a little bit more of the focus on the concept driven, threat informed capability development, which is what the joint weather fighting concept does and which is what the Air Force as a service was aligning under. I uh, just heard this week that uh, General Milley, one of the things he wants to do before he leaves was to establish a joint futures organization. It sounds a lot like Joint Forces Command. Um, <laughs> rest in <laughs> peace. Mattis killed that. Yeah. Uh, but it did some different stuff. Um, but it was interesting. The the press release I saw was, uh, you know, the problem they're trying to solve with this is like, hey, the Army is doing force design out to 2040. The Marine Corps is designing to 2030. The Navy and the Air Force are designing somewhere to like 2045. And the Space Force is still trying to find their pants. So like, who's, <laughs> who's actually going to align these horizons and drive requirements? Uh, ultimately, the, the Joint Staff approves joint interoperability requirements the j-rock does that mm -hmm. um, but no one's really driving the time horizons for the investments to th do the things that align with the, the operating concept so it'll be curious to see how that how that works out um let's jump into wargaming since uh, we've kind of been teetering around about it mm -hmm. um when i hear wargaming and i have i participated in one uh it was an unclassified one but it was still uh, i thought it was gonna be dumb and i actually learned a lot so that's my, my first impression it sounds like it would be like a top secret Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> it's not when you not hear like hard. wargaming, some guys in like, you know, in military uniforms rolling dice. So, so tell us a little bit about what, who participates, like what is a war game and, and what are, what have you been, your different levels and participation that you've done? Some of them are air force centric. Some of them are joint. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit about that. What we mean by wargaming, if uh, like so I think it's kind of hard sometimes. You might go to the 1984 movie and think that that's what it's like. You have some big supercomputer in the background that's just uh, determining everything. <laughs> but that's not it. Uh, no, it's think of it more of a seminar style event, uh, usually with hundreds of people, and you have multiple teams. And so you're going to have a, a white force. It's generally, the folks who are running the war game, the folks who design the war game. Uh, and this, you know, like for a big war game, you're talking about, it's a year long effort and it starts with defining, you know, what is the objective? What do we want to learn out of this war game? Um, so you have your white force people who are, are, are designing the game and who are running the games and that gets down into mechanics and time horizons. And is it a strategic level game? Is it an operational level game? Am I going to focus, is it allies and partners? So am I going to try to learn more strategic level you know, basing overfly rights, you know, as, as, if that's, if I'm going to learn that, or is it going to be more of a tactical level where I'm trying to understand how emerging concepts of employment, you know, different ways of doing things like man machine teaming or palletized munitions or something like that. Uh, is it going to be more of that focus? So you got that. And then you're going to have a, a blue team who is the, you know, generally the, the U S and allies and partners. So that you put those together. And so the blue team is really driving the war game because they're driving the ideas of the new concepts of how I'm going to fight or, you know, the new war fighting constructs. Then you have a red team who's the, you know, playing the adversary. And that's generally folks from your intelligence community. Uh, and there's even kind of specialties of folks in the intelligence community who focus on futures intelligence. So understanding, you know, what the Chinese force structure might look like 20 years from now and how they might want to fight. So those so the red team comes in, and then you have a, a often, sometimes you have a green team. A green team are, are your allies, partners, neutral nations, other political entities, and and how you build those teams uh, is all driven by the um, the level that the game is at. So your participants um, might be different depending if it's operational level versus strategic level. 
So then you put all these people together and then you, you have this time horizon and then you generally have some kind of a move counter move where, uh, and, and this all gets into design where the blue might do an action. Then we'll see what, what red does. And then, then white, the white force adjudicates what happens. And again, that's where you get into this, uh, or war games won or lost. No, we're just trying to have a plausible outcome of an interchange. So that might be the move might be a one day thing, or it might be something like I, I describe actions that I might take over a year. And then I try to get some feedback from that. And then you just iterate and you go through the entire cycle. Um, so it's, there's a lot of subject matter expertise. It's a lot of kind of fuzziness. It's a, usually there's some tools involved in terms of managing the chess boards, you know, some kind of tool. There's often, if it's more of an operational or tactical game, you're going to have a lot of models and sims that are feeding this. So like, if I make certain movements, I have a, a logistics team who's going to tell me uh, how much fuel I have, or they're going to come back and say, you know, you've run out of fuel in these places and, or you run out of munitions. So you have all those different teams working together. And then we kind of come out with an outcome of what happened in a move. And then you do a move counter move again until you uh, reach the end of the capstone exercise. So the war gaming is a lot more, it tends to be a lot more subject matter expert focused. It's really more about the players, a little bit less about cool computers, models, and Sims, but those usually feed, um, feed the event. I uh, I just looked this up. I just had this thought while you were talking, uh, Paul Van Riper, does that name ring a bell? He was the uh, retired Marine general. The, he was the op four for the, for a mm -hmm. Marine Corps war game. Uh, so, uh, I had to look it up to remember the details, but so he was pulled in as a retired general uh, to lead the red team for a war game the Marine Corps did in 2002 called Millennium Challenge, and uh, and mm -hmm. he basically adopted an asymmetric strategy. So the scenario was basically, hey, you're in the Middle East with a regional uh, belligerent that rhymes with Iran, and you have basically the superpower <laughs> of the United States Navy and Marine Corps in in the Gulf, and you know conflict happens, go. And so he adopted a, an asymmetric strategy where he didn't, he basically used all kinds of things that you would, you wouldn't think of. Um, so he used uh, motorcycles with couriers instead of radios. He launched a fleet of small boats with cruise missiles and he basically sank an aircraft carrier and like a half a dozen other warships and killed 20,000 sailors in the first two days of the war game. And they actually had to pause mm -hmm. the war game and reset it because he just destroyed the United States Navy uh, with just a couple of ships and cruise missiles. And, and that actually ended up, you know, fast forward, everyone kind of criticized him of like, Hey, you're, you're just playing the wind. Like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm stress testing all of your assumptions. And so they reset the game, they changed the conditions and miraculously the Navy won. Um, but if you fast forward, uh, 10 years from that war game, like that became the thing that the, uh, Iran adopted. So he actually <laughs> looked, he saw like 10 years in the future, like the fac fiac kind of thing, a small boat swarming tactics, like Iran adopted that. And that's like, that's a, not a small problem. <laughs> so it, these things are very, very insightful and you know, people can get, you know, mad about winning or losing, but to your point, it's not about winning or losing. Like the, the information gleaned from bringing in someone that's disruptive to just really pressure test what you're trying to do. Like, well, that's what the enemy's going to do. Like, I'd want to, I'd want to learn that, you know, rolling some dice in a board game, uh, than actually, you know, blood and treasure. Right. And it's, it's good for testing biases, uh, that we all have. So I think, uh, it's very difficult, I think for the blue players to really completely understand red, you know, and when you think China, when you put, when someone role plays and, and someone that has studied how, the Chinese think and, and they studied their doctrine deeply. And then you, that turns from not just a theory or something that I've read, uh, but it turns into actions. And we, we come up with plausible actions based on what we understand. And then when you see those actions, that's when you, that's when you have the aha moment of, okay, now I really understand the problem. And so you, you'll hear a lot. If you type up like JWC, you'll hear, Concept driven threat informed, concept driven threat informed. So, uh, the, from the strategic level, there's always been this idea that we really need to understand the way that Red thinks, the way that China thinks. And so, the war gaming really helps uncover that and really uncover some of those biases and assumptions that we walk into. 
Yeah, General Brown, who's going to be the next chairman of the Joint Chiefs, he was he he was big on that starting about two years ago. But know thy enemy. Read about how mm-hmm. China thinks. Don't just look at the spec mm-hmm. sheets of their equipment. Know how they think. Know how they organize. Know how they train. Uh, the equipment's mm-hmm. the easy part. The other stuff that really gets insights into how they think, how they're going to fight, and really the will to fight too. Uh, what what's the funniest thing that you've seen happen in a war game? Oh boy, that's a good question. Um, they're usually pretty intense, uh, and I think you at least. I've often been the blue lead for the game, and so I get um, pretty intense. And I think that you'll uh, people kind of get into the roles, um, but I think I've worked a lot with General Highnote, and he's do- he does a very good job of role playing. Because sometimes, you know, if we're doing more of an operational game, you know, he'll pretend to be Madam President, you know, ten years from now, and then he'll he'll write some kind of press statement or something like that to kind of keep the narrative going. And he's really, really, really good at getting in role. So I try to picture this. I've General High Note as Madam President reading yep. a memo in like this high pitched voice. Is that is that is that a thing? No, he Please didn't quite go that far, thing. but Okay. He didn't quite go that <laughs> far, but he did he did like he did invent a persona for the president and like kind of kind of describe the political environment of, you know, who got her elected, what was her base, you know, so there's a little bit so you can kind of play into the the political pieces of this because so much boy, where we get wrong in this is um if if you get in an operational level war game, you get a bunch of operators, then you know, of course, every nail that's that's out there, you know, we have a hammer and so uh we just want to hammer down on everything and that's really not the right answer. Uh, the right answer is often a, a lot of restraint at the operational level to te- achieve strategic objectives. And he was really good at playing those scenarios out because I've done several war games with him. It was always fun to watch him do it like the second or third time. Cause I kind of knew it was going to happen and watching the, uh, the, the training audience kind of react to that was, was pretty entertaining. Nice. Uh, okay. I'm on the same lines. Uh, uh, and we'll get to some of the examples of capability uh, and concepts that have come out of the war games uh, in a minute. What is like the most surprising thing that you've seen leading a war game where you just got completely annihilated or or just like blindsided by something that you hadn't anticipated? You're like, huh, and really took something to heart. The first few, so I've done like the different China scenarios, South China Sea, Taiwan. I think I've participated in 25 or 30 war games over those scenarios so i've seen them played in very different ways and i've seen the red teams play in different way and i've seen the blue teams play in different ways what i think i've learned if i can say broadly because i have to be careful i try to speak i'm speaking in generalities and things that you can generally find in open press right but uh what i see is um the first couple games, again, I think we 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 always went for uh, as a blue team for like what's the operational advantage? You know, what what do I need to do operational advantage? And that often, you know, what you'll find there's some some truths, especially as war we look at future war 10, 20 years from now. This is a long answer, I'm gonna get there. Is there's a, a truism of like the there's an inherent advantage in the offensive. And you see that playing out in the space domain, you see that playing out in the cyber domain. You see that with missiles and missile defense and counter air, uh, and you see that um, even surface warfare. So there's a there's a trend of if operationally you want to gain advantage, there's a kind of a first movers offense better than defense advantage operationally. And so th- what you get is you, you kind of get into who's going to go first, and then are we more reactive, and then and then what's your targeting strategy out of that. And what happens is, is you often see in these scenarios, the things escalate very quickly. And then you kind of get into this strategic escalation question and how you walk the ladder and how do you control that? When, you know, if we're trying to do JADC2 and we're trying to close thousands of kill chains and hundreds of hours and the Chinese are trying to do the, the same thing, operationally, things are moving very quickly. And then it's difficult to understand how that's impacting the strategic environment. So what I've noticed is that when we've gotten a little more nuanced about how we apply the military instrument of power and we apply it, maybe it's not all about going thousands of kill chains, but maybe it's just very specific uses of military power. It tends to have better strategic outcomes in terms of the insights we're gaining and more gaming. I'm not saying we win or lose, but 
you know, the, a lot of times we will define losing by, you know, operational level wins or losses, but it's really the strategic level that we care about. And so what has surprised me is that it's even more nuanced than I thought. I knew that as a strategist, but I, I've seen General Hino uh, play the game a little differently, you know, as a three-star than he did as a one-star. And I, and I saw him learn. I saw the joint force learn. And he definitely learned how strategic victory just looks different. Um, and so that's why defining winning is a very nuanced thing. And that's kind of my biggest takeaway of my last war game was the specific application of military power. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I've, I'll have some analogies to that. They may or may not directly translate, but to your point about, uh, basically like a, your, your feedback, your OODA loop, like with the A, if I have this blitz of thousands of kill chains and hundreds of hours, I really can't fully appreciate the impact that that's going to have to then be able to iterate in a way that makes operational strategic sense. And then I'd risk mm -hmm. devolving into a tactical whack-a-mole with targets without having the context of the impacts of that. Because eventually each one of those weapons going against a Chinese adversary or foreign adversary, it's going to matter whether a tactically operational strategic and having that lens really matters. Uh, when we were in Afghanistan, the the saying going out the door, it was uh, we would call it a defensive cast kind of scenario. Uh, it was most of Afghanistan, which is like one bomb will never win this war, one bomb will lose this war. So be smart, mm -hmm. do the right thing. We trust you. But to your point, when you try to accelerate that and do it at the scale and intensity that you're talking about, and it's funny I mentioned Boyd. Uh, John Boyd was famous uh, for his uh, 42nd Boyd bet where uh, he would start off defensive flying BFM, and if anyone could uh, could beat him in 40 seconds, he would pay them. Uh, I think it was like $20 or $40. And he did it for like five or six years at Nellis. Never lost a dogfight. But the but the funny secret was the, the way that he won is he would just, he did the same like five scripted moves that the fight's on without even looking at the adversary. And then after that, then he would assess. So he would <laughs> maneuver, 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 assess. And then he was hoping that the adversary in his case was was maneuvering a relationship to his maneuver and he was just doing it so much faster without even thinking about the adversary that he was four to five moves ahead because of those the the deviations of point counterpoint and so if you apply that at a strategic level it can go very very bad if you just randomly just start doing things uh, thinking that i'm just going to quote overwhelm the enemy and you know break their will to fight uh, so mm -hmm. that was a long way to say, yes, I agree with you. And I understand. And I hope the listeners uh, <laughs> picked up on that. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, I, and I think that's part of what this whole, this whole process has been, you know, the, the this war fighting uh, concept is learning some of those nuances uh, and the way that you do that is, and the, the war game is the best tool that we have to do that. So. Yeah. And we say, um, uh, it's a globally integrated war game. I understand that's all the services and five eyes, right? It depends. Um, it's, okay. uh, we, in the last iteration, yes. Um, the, the very first iteration of the game, we didn't have five eye participation. So there's, you know, there's pl pluses and minuses, um, in terms of when you're doing force design and force development, you know, you certainly we're going to do this with allies and partners. So we need to understand what the allies and partners bring um strategically like like when even we're talking about basing overfly and when do you anticipate coming in the fight or you know what interest do you have in and, and things like you know working with the australians they see this as a north south fight we see it as an east west fight and that sounds really simple yeah. but um it's actually really important when you start talking about logistics and and how are you going to feed and fuel the fight so that's really important but a lot of what we do when we're talking about force design 10 or 15 years from now it just as you know, it gets into acquisition SAPs, so special access programs. So a lot of our nuanced capabilities rely in those ranges. And so if we're really wanting to test design concepts that involve a lot of SAPs, when you start trying to do it with allies and partners, it becomes really difficult. So then, so you lose a little bit in terms of the operational level of the game and bringing in allies and partners because it's, you can't fully test all your ideas. Uh, just because of security issues, but you gain a lot in the strategic part of that. And that all comes back to game design and what you're trying to learn. Uh, for those who aren't tracking, we talk about top secret. That's kind of vertical uh, security classifications. And then you have horizontal classifications or compartments. And so your 
your sensitive compartmented uh, information, SCI, that's your intelligence sources and methods that derive the threat informed information. And then when they say fully informed, that's the SCI part, so the intel about the threat, and then all of the technology and capabilities. And that's that other side are called special access programs. So when we're talking about all the services globally fully informed classification levels, we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of compartmented programs of information. And so like, what do we actually have? What are we spending all this money in the Pentagon on? Here's what we're spending it on. You go, oh, interesting. Didn't know that. Hmm. And so that's the kind of level that informs. And that gets distilled down many, many classification levels as, as a, people can see kind of a diluted uh, kind of concept document. One of the biggest benefits, honestly, of the globally integrated wargame concept is um, it, it helps solve some of those issues of getting access, especially into sister service programs. So the Navy and the Army can see what the Air Force is doing and vice versa. Because getting access into joint programs like outside of your service is otherwise there's generally not portfolios that are good for that. But a wargaming portfolio really opens that up. And so there's within the context of the joint warfighting concept development and the global integrated war game, uh, there is a specific portfolio of programs that are truly joint that really opens up, especially to your worker B level folks in the Pentagon, you know, your lieutenant colonels and majors and colonels who are kind of doing a lot of the the work there. The a lot of the general officers have have access to the information, but the people who are using the information day in and day out are are at that level. And the that construct yep. has been really useful for crosstalk at those levels. Yeah, to your point, like if you have a target, you can hit it by air, land, or sea. Well, the army guy, he's got a land-based long-range missile or something, long-range fire, but he doesn't know that, you know, well, the Navy, they have a subsurface capability with a submarine because that's under several different special access programs. And the Navy guy doesn't know about the B-2's capabilities because that's under its own special access programs. And so the compartment and information across the services means that you can't approach a problem from a globally integrated perspective. And that's been the one of the hundreds of securities issues that we've had over the whatever 40 or 50 years we've had compartmented programs hopefully it's going to be getting fixed i hear good things but mm -hmm. bureaucracy is a it's a hard thing to kill yeah in the short <laughs> term honestly the, the wargaming profile in, in terms of like to your point uh, there's acknowledged need to fix that entire construct but that will take years to undo and to to make right uh, all the way down to how we do computers and who talks to who but um, in the short term, honestly, having a wargaming portfolio is a easy way to get the right people into the right conversations. So that has been really useful in my experience. In the globally integrated war game, are you doing it globally or are you doing it as a sandbox where you can you it's global, but it's kind of we're focusing on this region to constrain kind of the moves of the of the the war game, or are you really trying to do like a globally So I've seen both uh, you know, GIWG 1.0 actually brought in um, all the combatant commands and uh, we had different rooms and and they had uh, a lot more active play. So it was a little bit more of a strategic level game, which is useful. Uh, but when you're ultimately, if you're, you're JWC, ultimately, when, if I'm trying to get design elements out of it, I've got to get to that operational tactical level and the services, that's really kind of their job. But so the globally integrated war games have tended to be a little more strategic level. Um, so the first one that I participate in brought in all the combatant commands and it was truly global. This last one was in design. It was more focused on, it was more operational, more on the, because we're trying to test some operational concepts out. So we still had global perspective. So you have a green and a blue team who is trying to tell you, trying to feed the players context because so much of your operational decisions are driven by strategic context. But we didn't have as many strategic players in the game. It was more focused on the area of operations. So it was more of a JOA, more of a, we had a joint force commander and they were looking at, but that still gets, so we weren't trying to solve uh, command and control in that game. We had to just kind of uh, talk away some of that. But the first one, we really focused on command and control. So again, each, every game has had a different flavor and, and we've learned different things because of the focus of the game. I don't know if it was that war game or uh, the first one you're talking about that was, that was global or another one about the same time uh, when I was in the Pentagon. But I remember, uh, I want to say it was a Russia example. And I remember um, 
a certain three star or four star at the time talking about afterwards uh, informally. And he's like, well, you know, things kicked off in Eastern Europe with NATO wasn't Ukraine at the time. And so it was a combatant commander's perspective, like who's going to do what? And so UCOM, uh, uh, European command, he's involved, obviously. Well, then the Stratcom commander who owns all the nukes, they go on high alert. And so they're pulled the nuclear bombers and the subs for that mission. And so UCOM goes, oh, well, there go half my bombers. And then Northcom goes, well, now I'm going to elevate my homeland defense alert levels. And now I have to prepare to defend over the Arctic. Well, there goes a third of my fighter squadrons. And then <laughs> Southcom gets involved because now is an indirect pressure campaign with you know, Venezuela, which Russia is very, very active in and, uh, and down there. And then Indopaycom gets involved because they're doing a, a distraction indirect campaign on Eastern Russia, so think like blockades for oil and industrial machinery and things like that. And then there's actually no one in charge because those combatant commanders, uh, there's no one in charge of them. They all independently report to the secretary of defense. You think that the mm -hmm. chairman of the joint chiefs is like the, he's the senior military officer, but he has no command authority. He has no troops. He's not in the chain of command. He is literally an advisor to the president, the secretary of defense and the national security council. So in this, in this like uh, tabletop war game, all these four stars are like, well, well who's going to coordinate all this? Like, I don't know. Like, I guess the secretary of defense is going to run this whole thing. I'm like, well, we probably want someone with a global like joint perspective with a uniform that has like 30 or 40 years of experience involved in this process somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's that was, uh, funny that you bring that yeah. that's that was globally integrated war game one and that's no oh, okay well, so that was exactly, that one. Okay. that's exactly what we focused on it's what you're describing <laughs> is each of the combatant commands you know pulling their resources and there wasn't like a, a global integrator so we they in the game tested some concepts of a global integrating function so that's a perfect example of like how you can use a war game or at the strategic level in this case of command and control and who's going to do what and where does the, you know, where would that function reside? And you would want to build a, a function for it. It's the, the reality is it probably comes down to the personalities uh, who are leading those organizations at the time of the conflict, because it, it becomes really political and a lot about relationships and power and all those kind of things. But there was a lot of learning that happened. That's really helpful from a force design perspective, though. I think a lot of the feedback we gave to that game is if we want to get down to con ops and then con imps and ultimately i'm trying to sell you what widgets yeah, i want you to put in the budget i need a game design that gets me a little more towards that operational end and that's what the last iteration was more of that operational flavor so we can kind of answer more about how are we going to fight as a joint force which is more helps us buy the right widgets but we still have to fix the command and control pieces of that that's a that's a good segue into Okay, I've done a war game. Now what? Yeah. <laughs> so we'll talk about so, uh, some some widgets in a second. But I just want to highlight, like when you look at future forecasting and trends, which another episode we'll talk about, and then war gaming, you can start to see what science and technology investments you need to make. Mm -hmm. And so that informs, uh, which actually just recently came out, the National Defense S and T strategy. Mm -hmm. So we have a we now have a S and T strategy. Um, and it identifies 14 kind of critical tech areas for investment um, for R&D. So your R&D money to develop the science and technology. Once you develop s and it can be matured into R&D. So we're doing component development, prototypes and demos. And then eventually R&D money turns into OSD, which is uh, operational system design um, and EMD. So in uh, what is it? engineering, manufacturing and design. So we're building the thing. Mm -hmm. So you go from uh, science to development to build it and field it. Mm -hmm. And so if we fast forward to the end, what are some of the widgets that you can talk about and concepts that have come out of this that everyone's like, yep, if we invest here, we can have, we can predict this kind of outcome on joint fires integration of either filling a capability gap or influencing the adversary in a way that provides deterrence. I'll talk about the process and then I think we can talk about some products. So just a little bit okay. on the, the process. So we, we talked about this joint warfighting concept that we test in the, in the context of the globally integrated war game. There's along with that, there's numerous other experiments and, you know, modeling and simulation that goes to feed that at the joint level. Then, the, of course, the services have their own service level war games. Um, so big title 10 games. So, for instance, the Air Force, we have Futures Game. And Futures Game 
generally focuses on that further time horizon, especially in the Air Force, because when you talk about a lot of things we buy in the Air and Space Force, it's a long lead uh, kind of stuff. You know, the Marines might be able to buy stuff quicker just because of the kind of equipment they tend to buy compared to Air and Space Forces in general. So we have those longer lead games, and those games, you know, we're testing concepts and developing them and maturing them, and then we bring the best of breed into the joint gaming environment. It's generally the same people too who are participating. It's the same group of folks. So we kind of do our own iterations and our own service learning, then we take that into the broader joint context. And you get these concept required capabilities that feeds into the JROC, the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, which then informs the chairman's program recommendation which then goes into defense planning guidance. And then the defense planning guidance then tells the services Palm program objective memorandum and gives guidance on how we should spend our money for the budget. So that's the joint process. The reality is it's it's not as defined. You know, we can make a PowerPoint slide and the, the reality is is we're doing our own concepts, we're testing them in the joint environment. And you know, we're so the services are kind of writing our own guidance. You know, because we put we we help write the concept required capabilities that go into the defense planning guidance. So we're kind of giving ourselves our own guidance in a way, which is yeah. a, a good thing, you know, but it's with joint understanding and in a joint context. And then we have to go then and program the money. Um, and then the reality is, is when you hit the palm and you know this, you've talked about this on uh, a lot at the merge is. I've done all this thinking and it comes down to, I don't really have that much money that I can reprogram in this palm. And there's only like one or two of these widgets out of all the widgets I'd like to, to go after that I can actually put money against. And so hopefully what we've done a good job in the five in this, in the air force features in the strategy is we've kind of defined the design. These are the places we'd like to go. And then now we're going to have those hard conversations with the programmers and the acquisition specialist. So it's that three kind of arm, the strategy, the, the programming, and then the uh, acquisition. And then, and then the reality hits that um, of all this cool stuff, I can, I can only do like two or three things. And then, and then we just have that conversation with the chief and like general high note, the five and the eight, they get together and like, well, this is your to-do list that you'd like to get after. And boss, we can only get after these couple things in this budget. And what are the priorities? So we get the one or two widgets and we get a couple good wins out of it and just hope that we get more money next year. So just to sum that up, you know, Hey, there's 10 things out of this that we really want. By the time it makes it down to the services, it's like, okay, there's seven that made it through the cut goes up to the chief and look at the budget. We can afford three of them. So we're going to put three in the budget. It's not a budget. It's a budget request. Yep. Then it hits politics and those three gets chopped down to like, you know, one to one and a half maybe. Right. Because to fund something, you have to defund something else. And that's what gets to very, very, very political, which uh, we won't get into that today. But that's where you see the, the politics and reality get in the way. Not get in the way, but it's yeah. it's part of the checks and balances of government. It's the cost that we pay for, uh, for the society we live in. Right. Uh, all right. So what are some of the things that you've gotten across the finish line out in the public you can uh, tell us about that came out of these. So one thing I think it serves as a good example and to the illustration of just trying to understand how difficult this whole process is in future planning. And so agile combat employment is one that's really good to talk about. So ACE. So ACE is a concept really. And the concept is for those who are unfamiliar, it's when you look at air forces, um, we're very maneuverable at the tactical level. So an, an aircraft can move around. I can change where I'm going to land. At the operational level, we're not very maneuverable. You know, if you're going to launch a B-52, there are only certain pieces of concrete in the world where I can launch a B-52 or a B-2. And so that means that the bases become very vulnerable. And so really what I worry about is how do I protect my bases? And in the China context, it's really from missile threats. So a lot of people think about, we talk about air superiority in the Air Force. And we generally imagine the average airman, I would think, would think about air superiority in terms of tactical wins, like a fighter and doing a, you know, fighter v. fighter, it's top gun style, you know, I'm going to go rage. But in 2017, we actually redefined air superiority as the degree of control of the air that allows you to execute operations without prohibitive interference from air and missile threats. And so those missile threats hold our bases 
at risk and that those bases are at risk, that's where you know launching and generating air power becomes an issue. So ACE is one of the methodologies that's it's doctrinally it's defensive counter air. It's a way to protect my forces by disaggregating and not putting all of my like I don't want to go to Guam and put everything that I have in the Air Force on this one uh, Anderson Air Force Base because it just takes one big missile attack to make all of those airplanes go away. So I need to think about how I can rapidly aggregate and dis disaggregate my forces. But to do that, it's a lot of logistics. It's a lot of prepositioning of equipment. It's a lot of how do I do things differently? And so there's a lot of pieces to it. There's passive measures and shelters and there's tool sets that I need to have like on little islands pre-positioned and ready for me to do this so that I need to buy a lot of things in a lot of different places. So ACE, now I have this a concept required capability to do ACE, but then to your point, now I have to go to the Air Force corporate structure and it turns out for me to do ACE, I need to buy stuff from multiple different pieces of the eight puzzle. So there's I have to talk to a lot of different people, like logistics people. And then, you know, and so to find those offsets, there's no I, ACE line item budget. There's no one line. There's item no budget. one line. Put money in that peck and like, give me the money and we'll make it happen. Correct. Doesn't exist. Not, not easy. So now I need to find offsets across multiple different portions all to get one kind of aggregate capability. And it's really hard to write just a one requirement. So we did take ACE as a concept. We wrote what's called a strategic requirements document, which is kind of an agile new way of doing requirements. So I could say, I, I need this capability. So we're able to develop that requirement. And then we really worked a lot with the programmers to find those offsets and find that money in, in a lot of different spaces. And it's, uh, it's really complex and it took a couple of years of working at it and I've left it. It was still working when I left the building and I know they're still working it today, but I think we've had a lot of success with moving money towards ACE kind of capabilities. We're seeing ACE training. We're seeing ACE doctrine because it's not just buying stuff, but it's also writing doctrine and, and getting this into uh, um, how we do professional military education. And, and so a lot of that's been happening even faster than I had anticipated. So I, I would call that a success story is seeing ACE being understood, trained to, and then funded uh, these last few years. Yeah. Shout out to, uh, ACC debt three, the agile battle lab that was set up to try to do some of this trader, um, trader out there. Um, he's work. fighting a good fight, fine American just didn't have the authorities or resources to do the things that, that are, that are being asked. And so you see that resource authority disconnect the say, do you gap a lot of sleepless nights trying to find a way to, to have an impact? Um, because like I said, there's not really one person accountable for this. It's a new way of doing business mm -hmm. and like, there's no one line item in the budget. Uh, so that, that's a, a very cross cutting, um, concept. That's easy to talk about. Very, very, very hard to execute, mm -hmm. especially with aircraft as they get older and older. Then you have things like the F-35, which, which uses a two tier maintenance, not a three tier, like every other aircraft in the United States. And then the department of defense doesn't own the supply chain. Uh, the contractor does. And so having visibility in the pre stage and supplies and things like that, uh, shout out also when you talk about ACE real quick to, um, special operations. So when we think about air force special operations, we think of like counterinsurgency and ISR, but they actually have placement and access missions. So they can go in all these countries years and years ahead and foster relations and we have positive relations and we, they're doing all these assessments for airfields and we call POL oil. Where are the, what are the supplies? What's the manufacturing base? And so they're keeping those relations. So when we do need something, we have the information, we have context, we have, uh, we have the relations. So P and a placement and access shout out to uh, air force special operations. All right. In the time we have left, can you talk about any specific widgets like hardware wise that come out of those concepts? Yeah, I would say there's one that's kind of a near term and one of far term. So we could talk a little bit about palletized munitions, palletized effects. And I think, uh, collaborative combat aircraft CCAs, yeah. uh, that have all kind of come out of war gaming and analysis. So. We'll start with palletized munitions. Uh, I don't, it's hard to claim that as a complete win right now, but it's, uh, we've had some, some wins and, and I think there's some uh, really interesting things that came out of it. But when you look at, so what problem are you trying to solve? So really when you look at the Pacific problem set, 
it all comes down to capacity and posture. You know, I have a very difficult, wicked problem where I'm trying to operationally bring a lot of effects in a short amount of time when I'm not optimally postured. I've got this global posture problem that we talked about where um, I have assets that, you know, as soon as, uh, you know, Stratcom withholds bombers and then I've got tankers that are withholding, that's really the tankers that hurt because, you know, the Pacific's a big ocean. It takes a lot of gas to get effects there. And then when I look at the problems sets of, I've got bombers that can only operate from certain locations. And um, I'd like to be able to disperse some capability and maybe be able to operate from some smaller airfields. And then so this idea of a palletized munition is not to replace my bomber capability, but could I augment my bomber capability with some long range fires from cargo aircraft? And then that becomes pretty interesting you know, a C-17 that can operate off of a, a 3,000 foot unimproved piece of concrete. That is very interesting. And then also just there's some strategic ambiguity that I introduced there because I I, I know a cargo airplane could be a bomber. I don't know. And when they're, the bombs are inside, I don't know if they're loaded. And, and I could pick them up and instead of just delivering munitions for a bomber then to put on and then go, I could just direct delivery. So it, there's some interesting problems that that gets after. You talk about strategic ambiguity, there's the tactical yeah. ambiguity of that, which is it's a cargo plane or, or not. Maybe it's a bomber. That was the concept mm-hmm. about, hey, if we put missiles on bombers, the bomber could shoot you down, but you wouldn't even know it. Um, mm-hmm. Or the my favorite was the we put the AIM-9Xs on the MQ-9s uh, mm-hmm. out at Nellis for some, some testing. And they killed a couple of Raptors uh, because the F-22s were just like, oh, it's, a, it's an MQ-9, not a big deal. It's like, and you're dead. Like, what? Like that thing has missiles now? Right. Yeah. So totally get it. But if you acknowledge it, now you have to honor the threat and you don't know which ones have it. So it's a little bit of a shell game and you have to honor all of them because you just don't know. Right. So the ambiguity is definitely a strategy. Right. And that's in terms of the way that the Chinese think, you know, we'd like to be more ambiguous um, and that's just kind of what they do to us. So that's how a concept starts. It's an idea of uh, I've got these problems or what are some ways I could do it? And then that kind of led into not only the work. So we did a lot of war gaming, of course, did a bunch of analysis because people would say, well, you know, you're taking away from cargo capacity we need. Well, no, we can answer all those questions and do all that homework. And so there's a lot of homework that went along, along with that. That's like the number one feedback that you hear from like people who just don't know or enthusiasts. You know, that plane was bought to move cargo and now it's going to drop bombs. So the bomber guys are like, well, you know, get off my lawn. Like I'm a bomber guy. But, but you're to your point, like the C-17 was designed to deliver an M1 tank in like a dirt strip landing. Like I'm pretty sure we could, we can use that uh, with its range payload and, and short field requirements to do some good things. And if you look at the scenarios that we're talking about, like you're not gonna deploy 100,000 troops on the ground for anything. That's, that's probably not the scenario that we're talking about. Mm, exactly. So the reality is, is for those that say you're just, you're taking away from our ability to move critical, at, well, it's, it's, it was like 0.001% of the requirements is what we're taking away. And oh, by the way, the effects that you get out of that are so much greater, you know? So anyway, a lot of great homework that went with that. And what I think what the biggest thing I would highlight is it's one of these concepts that lend itself into some rapid experimentation. So we had SDPE, so strategic development planning and, um, execution put together this experiment where we you know we talked about maybe get dropping jasms out of the back of a so the standoff missiles and so they designed this ability to do that with this thing called a dragon cart which is basically a way that i could palletize and then put a standoff missile into a cargo aircraft and then deploy it and and really in a very short amount of time you know we're talking uh like a year went from concept to an actual experiment where we proved the concept. And so, and that, and it's, you know, it's something that it, I don't have to make any um, improvements or add anything to a C-17 or C-130. It's something you can export to an ally or partner that maybe doesn't have any bombers, that mainly only has cargo aircraft. And now our allies and partners have a ability to employ and that adds more strategic ambiguity. So it's, but we were able to prove that concept out with an experiment and then actually have a real, capability that we could fund and then you know then grow from there i think it's that's about where we are so we'll see whether or not the the concept continues to live but i think going from concept to capability in a really short amount of time was it was a win and it's something that's it's a very interesting uh, capability for us to talk about 
it's a rapid dragon, so it, and it's basically we're going to drop out of the cargo hold. So we're going to deploy them, uh, drop the ramp, and this cart basically deploys these stealth cruise missiles that have about a 500-ish mile range. So that's what uh, that's what he's talking about. The uh, the OG of that concept, by the way, about a decade before this this idea came up, um, the exact same idea came up and was actually test dropped with Mauled. Mm -hmm. So. The, the issue with air launch decoys in the Air Force, there's only two airplanes that can carry them because the way the program was structured. Uh, again, it's policy and a little bit of money to fix it. Um, so they said, why well, can't we just throw them out of the back of uh, like C-130s and C-17s? Like, oh, we probably could. And they've you can go on YouTube to some videos of air dropping uh, mauled, so air launch decoys out of the back of a C-130. So not a new concept, but when you look at the the context, the environment, like, oh, now I can, I can do some other things with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right, let's talk about CCAs real quick um, as a teaser, and we'll have a whole other show in the future about CCAs, but um, how, how that concept came to be. You see the technology, so there's a little bit of, when you're a concept person, you're um, kind of watching the technology horizon. And so there's, AFL had a program called uh, LCAT, so low-cost attributable technologies. And at the same time, you had uh, some some different vendors who were building some of these smaller autonomous kind of fighter type aircraft. And so they kind of caught attention of folks that were concepts just like, you know, what could you do with these things? And, and really when you look at the operational level problem that you have in a China scenario, even to get episodic air superiority, you have a adversary who has a significant numeric advantage to you. And even if I put more fighters in the theater, which I don't want to do because of ACE, like I don't want to put like four fighter squadrons at one base and then because three of them are going to die on the ground. I only want to put so much stuff uh, forward that I can keep airborne because that's really what I do. I don't want them to be on the ground. I want to turn those sorties and to keep them airborne, I have to have tankers and I have to have gas. And, and so now when you start doing all of that math, when you think about air superiority and projecting counter air missions, so, uh, Paco, you know, we call it AMRAM math is it's all about if I, if I think I'm going to have 60 adversary in an area, then rough AMRAM math, I got to bring 120 AMRAMs to the, uh, to the fight. So just two to one, just for easy math. So if I'm going to bring 120 AMRAMs and I carry eight per aircraft, then that's how many aircraft I have to get airborne. And so you start playing these games of how am I going to get X number of airplanes against X number of anticipated threat with X number of missiles with the limitations of where I can base things and where I, where I have fuel and where I have enough missiles to do this, it becomes a pretty difficult problem to solve. So concepts where I start looking at how can I bring more numbers to the fight, uh, maybe more missiles, and where can I maybe launch an aircraft from not a runway, or if I can rail launch them, or if I can launch them off a shorter runway. And then uh, also when I'm maybe can I make my kill chains more effective? So maybe I don't need to bring two AMRAMs for every bad guy. And so to do that, I need more sensors and I need a higher probability of kill weapons. So I start looking at different mixtures of all of that. Like what would that look like? That campaign started about 2018, 2019 with low cost attributable technologies. And then what, what you find is that there's a cost point there of if it's too cheap, it's actually not survivable enough. And so we did, and to, to mm. figure that out, like I, we did all the high level modeling of these at the tactical level. So we're talking about special access program level modeling and simulation. So I can understand, you know, this widget that would only cost $7 million. Well, it's so unsurvivable. I'm just going to lose all of them. So maybe the right price point is to like bring a little bit more resilience to the platform, which means it's going to be a little bit more expensive, but like trying to find that right point of how many would add the capability, what capabilities are those? And a lot of that work started years ago. And I think the technologies and the concepts started to catch up. And I think we started to see some promise in that. And then all that led all the way to, I know what, you know, you've reported with Secretary Kendall announcing at AFA a commitment to this concept as a part of uh, future air superiority. It's not completely well-defined yet because that's just one of those where we're going to put a wedge on it and we're going to try to build towards it and iterate. But we, I think, have learned a lot about what the right designs might look like and what those right mission sets might be. 
and that all came from wargaming, modeling, simulation, a lot of conversations, looking across different vendors and looking at what these technologies might be able to do in the future. Nice. We've been talking for, uh, for probably a little bit over an hour now. You're retiring soon, and I'm sure that there's uh, listeners out there who'd love to, to chat more about what we've talked about today. Uh, pick your brain on some stuff and maybe about your future. So so where can people find you? Uh, well, I'm on, on LinkedIn, of course, but uh, we're getting ready to move to Atlanta is where we're going to settle down. And we picked Atlanta because it's one hop from anywhere in the world. And you know, I'm, I'm hoping to stay in the airspace, aerospace, keeping my finger around defense, not unlike what you have as you've retired. You found a, a really couple cool niches. It's kind of hard to spend a whole lifetime doing this and not want to keep uh, delivering, especially working in this future technology space and just wanting to build a better air force for a uh, future airmen, you know, and potentially, you know, some of our kids who might join the air force. Someday. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for those listeners, I'm going to drop a link to uh, it's a striker's LinkedIn profile in the show notes. Uh, so you can just click on it and, uh, and reach out and slide into his DMS. <laughs> so remember, if you like what you heard, uh, leave us a rating, spread the word, follow us. And then if you somehow got to the podcast without the newsletter, go to our website, links in the show notes, sign up for the newsletter. That's, uh, that's where all the good stuff is. Striker, thanks for, uh, for joining us today. I'm looking forward to chatting more in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Paco. It was a great, it was a good time. All right. That's it. That's the show. Do what you got to do. See ya.